analytical philosophy has, in a sense, founded on sand. Simon Blackman, welcome to How the Light Gets In. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you're famous for having a theory about metaethics, a theory about what exactly moral claims are about. And there's this common perception, both in philosophy, I think, and perhaps even a popular perception, that if we are to believe that moral claims like murder is wrong are objectively true and not sort of merely the expression of personal opinion, we somehow need to think that moral facts are part of reality. And on the other hand, if it turns out that moral facts are not, in fact, part of the fabric of the world, it seems that the only plausible alternative is that moral claims are just merely subjective expressions of personal opinion. So you famously reject that dichotomy. Can you explain yes. why and how you go right. about it? Well, I certainly try and avoid any metaphysics. So I don't have very much time for the side of it that you put, the side that would require something like the will of the universe or God's laws or something like that. Um, I, I reject that, so I am much nearer to the side which says it's all, all a matter of opinion, it's a matter of our attitudes. Uh, what I tried to do in my work was uh, explore a middle ground. I want to say it is a matter of our attitudes, but it's not merely a matter of our attitudes because our, our own um, capacities for thought enable us to scrutinize our attitudes and those of other people, and in a sort of holistic way, that is without foundations, but with bear, bringing to bear other considerations, we can often decide that an attitude was not justifiable, we, we, we reject it. So it's really about the acceptance and rejection of attitudes, including our own attitudes. Um, so what I wanted to do was defend, as it were, the objectivist trappings of moral thought without giving any ground to the metaphysics that usually goes with those trappings. Hmm. Does that mean that there aren't really any moral facts? So, you know, Wittgenstein famously said in his early work that the world is the totality of facts. So yeah. does that include moral facts? It didn't for Wittgenstein, no. And um, I, I think it's a very powerful intuition that, you know, when God created the world, he just had to create the physical world. <laughs> he didn't have to add or super add a, a, a layer of morality onto it. Um, uh, uh, as to whether there are any moral facts, well, that's a tricky one. Um, it, it brings this objectivist sounding baggage or metaphysics. But of course, we could answer it by saying, yes, here's a moral fact. It's a fact that you shouldn't um, uh, offer students different grades for sex. That's a fact. It's, um, uh, if you disagree with it, I'd be very surprised and rather suspicious of you. Um, but it's something that uh, virtually everybody would accept. And so it stands firm. Um, so if I say, do you think, uh, Alexis, that um, you know, uh, it's okay for the university professors to sell um, better grades for sex? You'd say no. Uh, and you could say, no, that's not true. Or you could say, no, that's not a fact. It is a fact that you shouldn't do it. Um, so there's, uh, the, the, the language of truth and fact has a grip when we talk about morality. And that's one of the things that uh, people like myself have to accommodate. Or uh, in some extreme cases, people say, oh, it's all a fiction. Um, and other people are just skeptical about the whole business. Um, but if you're serious about life, I think and you're serious about ethics, you're serious about morality, then you have to accept that some things stand firm. They, they are, as it were, done and dusted in the moral sphere, just as much as in the empirical sphere. And how do we, and how do you accommodate for this talk of moral facts? Is it just intersubjective agreement? Most of us agree on it, therefore it's fact? No, uh, because we might all be wrong. I think, we, I think there's no limit to the possibility of self-criticism. I think self-criticism skids off some cases like the one I mentioned. It skids off that because uh, I can't think of a criticism to bring to bear on the idea that it's wrong for university professors to uh, sell um, grade, better grades for, for sex. 
Um, so I can't imagine really a serious debate about it. So in that sense, debate has stopped. But that's true if we talk about whether we're in a tent. I mean, if, if I had to try and prove to you that we're in a tent, I wouldn't know where to start because nothing is more obvious than that we're in a tent. Um, if you started to worry about it, I'd start to worry about your mental health or your capacities. So, so I think that in the moral sphere, just as much as in the empirical sphere, there are views that stand fast. And then we use the language of truth and fact. Um, Peter Strawson, a philosopher I much admire, once postulated that you talk about true, it's often a way of saying ditto. So if I say, well, you know, you shouldn't do this, that, or the other, you could say that's true, or you could say ditto, meaning it goes for me, or copy that. I think Americans actually have a phrase, copy that, meaning roughly, I agree, or I judge that to be true. You mentioned earlier that the this, uh, this sort of self-criticism is always open, open-ended. Is that is that a kind of pragmatist commitment? Do you yes. see yourself aligned with yes. the pragmatist tradition? I do. I think it's very important that people cultivate a sense of self-awareness and a self, uh, sense of possibility of self-criticism. Uh, one of the disappointing things about the modern world of uh, tweets and you know, Facebook and Instagram and so on is that uh, people come up with certainties too quickly. And of course then there's as it were, the certainties according to Trump and the certainties according to other people. Um, but each side claims certainty. And I think people are far too quick to do that. And what about cases of extreme moral disagreement? At the moment, mm, yeah. there's this kind of debate being reanimated in the United States over uh, abortion, Morton, for yeah. example. Mm -hmm. How do we, in the absence of sort of hard moral facts that we can kind of help us yeah. guide our decision in the same way that maybe, you know, being in a tent is kind of, maybe you can point to something and say, well, here it is. You yes. know. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be an equivalent case in, in the moral facts. So how do we adjudicate when it's moral well, of course, disagreement of that le level? Uh, of course, that's where you get hard cases. And I think the abortion case, um, I have a definite view about it, but I think that it's uh, contestable, uh, sensibly contestable. That is, people who hold the other view, are not out to lunch, they've got a point. And negotiating the point is very difficult. The point, for example, if I'm liberal about abortion, as I am, I've got to recognize that people are going to say that the processes of development of life are continuous, there's no cutoff points. Um, the zygote starts off as a cell, which I think you have to be uh, really quite outrageous to say is a living human being. It's not any more than an acorn is an oak tree. But the process of becoming a living human being is then continuous. And the problem with abortion law is it will need to find a cutoff point. And people say, well, you know, we can't find a cutoff point, so we better say it's a human being from the get-go. Or we better not say it's a, say it's a human being till it's born. And neither of those seems comfortable. But I think people forget that we can all often find cutoff points, certainly in law, when processes are continuous. The process of driving ever more dangerously is continuous across increases of speed. But we say 30 miles an hour or whatever it might be. And you can go that far and no further. So it's quite possible to make sensible uh, uh, laws uh, inside uh, um, the, the um, apparent uh, con continuity of the process. And I think that's, that's how I would look at the abortion debate. In answering this, you said, well, I recognize that there's a different angle on this, there's a different argument. It's almost uh, like saying, well, I recognize there are different perspectives on this matter. And of course, a lot of philosophers, maybe starting with Nietzsche, sort of argued that this is the case with not only moral facts, but with everything. You know, we only have these kind of perspectival views on the yeah. world. There's no one objective right. truth, as it were, right. that we can all access. Yeah. So how do we, if we recognize that, if we say, well, there are different perspectives on this moral matter, how do we adjudicate between those perspectives? How do we know which ones are better ones? Well, well, 
Well, often we're not required to adjudicate between them because that, that presents us as if we're outsiders looking at two mm -hmm. um, things. Whereas, in fact, we've got an inside position. Um, you will come with a certain amount of moral baggage to the abortion debate, say, and somebody else may come with some slightly different moral baggage, but you're each of you involved. And so you don't have to choose between two positions. What you often do is try to persuade somebody of your position or try to persuade yourself that your position is the defensible one or the better defensible one. Um, so you, 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 you could hear two voices within yourself and then you have to, um, you know, sort it out. You have to not plump for one or the other, but try to choose one or the other in the light of your best thoughts, the best thoughts you can muster. That's all you've got, all you ever have. But having recognized that even if we can't somehow come outside of our skin, as it were, and look at the different perspectives from a third point of view, even if we recognize that we can only occupy a perspective and we can't somehow come outside it and adjudicate between different ones, doesn't that already water down the notion of objectivity? Can we really still hold on to it if we recognize that, well, our view on the world is, is a perspective, it's not an objective view? I think views or opinions become objective, um, not because they escape perspective, but because people can come to coordinate on them and agree with them. So think of an example. Um, suppose you're accused of a crime. Uh, well, now you want the police investigate, you're, let's say, accused falsely of a crime. You didn't commit it. You want the police investigation to be objective enough to discover that you didn't commit it. Um, now, it could be a, a very flaccid investigation, carelessly conducted. The police aren't curious about the evidence. There's all sorts of flaws and failures possible. The police can't then turn around and say, oh, that's just, that was just a different perspective. You say, no, you're not doing your stuff properly. You're not investigating in the way that this problem demands. And I think often we don't think in the way that moral problems demand. We don't take into account all the pluses and minuses. Um, there are examples in the history of philosophy, I think. For example, uh, the utilitarians, John Stuart Mill, Je Jeremy Bentham, Sidgwick, various others. Um, I think they thought that they were advancing a very objective, very defensible morality. Um, but in fact, if they'd thought more carefully, I think they might have realized that it required a lot more thought, a lot more, um, you know, repair than they realized. Um, for example, reconciling uh, the, the, uh, the task of promoting utility uh, with the necessity for justice in your dealings with other people. They didn't really see that as, as difficult as I think it is. So it's very easy to, to think, oh, I, I've got the answers here, when in fact you don't. But it's not just a matter of different perspective, it's a matter of doing better. <laughs> what you said there at the very beginning of your answer, that somehow the aim is objectivity through agreement, reminded me of Richard Rorty, who claimed yeah, that solidarity solid. is, yes. is the aim here, right? I, so true solidarity and yeah. kind of social agreement over this kind of yeah, idea of objective I, truth. However, you have disagreements with Rorty, yes, so where I do you yeah. part? Uh, you're right, I, I, I misspoke myself there. Um, it's, the aim is, I mean, social solidarity is good, and it is certainly one of our aims very often. So when we are um, discussing a moral issue like abortion, uh, I'd, I, you know, I'd be very pleased if we come out agreeing about whatever it is, uh, you know, wherever we do um, agree on the spectrum. Um, but I don't think that's the be all and end all, which Rorty did. Um, it's not that there's a beacon of truth somewhere, God's truth, the universe's truth, that we might worry about. But we might worry about whether we've all done our stuff properly or whether we're living in some kind of fool's paradise, um, that we've all been misled by some aspect of our culture, our history. Um, we're familiar enough with those 
sort of distortions. I mean, looking back, for example, on racism, the amount there was, even when I was young in Britain, uh, is quite different from the amount that's, uh, as it were, tolerable today. Um, I think that's a progress, and I'm glad it's gone that way. Um, and I look back at the sort of, as it were, racial miasma that covered us 50, 70 years ago um, with, with a certain amount of you know, shame and guilt. So does that mean that we're talking about solidarity not only with our current community, but an imagined future community that has carried on, as it were, the self-critique and self-examination? Yes, I think that's right. Um, we're familiar with that in sort of... Um, more everyday context. I mean, suppose uh, you and I might sort of say uh, go to the National Gallery and look at pictures, or we listen to a concert, and we agree that was really very good, or we you know, make various value judgments. Now we, we're probably aware that we are both amateurs in which are one of those, or all of those uh, areas, and we're aware that there may be people worth talking to and worth listening from, um, people who might uh, upset our judgment, say, well, actually, it wasn't very good. There was a, you know, she was singing flat, or um, uh, you think that Renoir is a great painter, but actually, when you look at Cezanne, he starts to seem a bit chocolate box and sentimental. Um, and you say, oh, I hadn't looked at Cezanne. Thank you for warning me. And, and maybe you go out to the gallery with a better or what you would regard, and I think regard with justice, as a better appreciation of the thing. Where do you exactly part ways with Rorty? Do you think Rorty places too much an emphasis on solidarity with one's current community and yes. less so with the future one? Yes. Um, I say that with some, uh, I mean, that's certainly been my opinion for a long time. Um, I really ought to reread Rorty to see whether there are uh, cracks in his edifice at that point. Because you'd imagine, given his sort of influences from Dewey and other pragmatists, that he would still perish, that he would also have an element of yes. projecting into the future and yes. never thinking, okay, we've arrived at the final truth. And that, that it's open, always an open process. That's right. That's exactly Peirce's view about process of, uh, processes of inquiry. And Rorty did present himself as a pragmatist in that tradition. Does this approach of how you think about moral truths or moral facts or moral claims, does it apply to facts about science, physics, geography, or are those claims less philosophically problematic, do you think? Well, this is, a, this is where there is a rift in the pragmatist loot. Um, there are pragmatists. Hugh Price is probably the best known. Hugh Price and Bob Brandom, who are more extreme and more universal pragmatists. Um, I myself started off quite a local pragmatist in the sense that I would say one thing about ethics and either say nothing or say something different about empirical judgments. I think subsequent work, um, which I very much admire and accept, has suggested that that's not an easy division to make. Um, you can see how it comes under pressure if you think of things like modal judgments, judgments of necessity, or judgments about uh, uh, counterfactuals, what would have happened if something or other. Um, it's quite easy to give a sort of pragmatist story about those, very akin to the one I give about ethics. Um, Gilbert Ryle was a pragmatist who, um, talking about um, if then and if such and such had happened, something else would have happened, or if something happens, something else must happen. He saw those as licenses, inferential licenses, inference tickets, he called them. Um, that is, you say those things, and if somebody agrees with them, uh, you expect them to make the appropriate inference. I uh, suppose I say, uh, uh, you know, Little Johnny's crawling around the floor, and I say, look, if he puts his finger in that electrical outlet, he's going to get a very nasty shock. Um, and I says, oh, gosh, yes. Um, I'd expect her then to draw the right inference, and perhaps the inference would imply uh, 
since we don't want him to get a nasty shock, we won't, don't want him to crawl around the floor. Um, and uh, um, the, the role of conditionals, counterfactuals, judgments of necessity in licensing inferences um, is a very powerful point in pragmatism because those sort of counterfactuals are involved in all our judgments. You know, if you judge that there's a chair over there, you will accept that if you were to try to walk through it, you'd meet an obstacle, you'd fail. Um, if you were to sit down, you'd have a comfortable support. There will all sorts of things follow from the judgment that there's a chair there. So no judgment is complete in and of itself. It's just a nugget of fact, which is, uh, is um, independent of other facts. So I think there's the, you know, um, so there's an hoping, opening for holism. There's an opening here. for holism here. Yes, exactly. And I think that holism is uh, is right. Actually, um, I think the uh, um, uh, Russell once said that um, Bradley saw the world as a pot of treacle, whereas he and Moore saw it as a heap of shot, um, where everything is independent and separable. Um, and I think that if that's the correct metaphor, then Bradley was nearer the truth than Russell. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask you because that, that was almost a kind of founding assumption of analytic philosophy in yes. Russell and Moore, this kind of yeah. individualism yeah. Yes. that, you know, we can examine things, and, and, and almost an atomism, that we can examine things yes. separate from everything else and that somehow tells us yes. the truth about them. Yes, that's right. Um, and of course, it was at one point ca called logical atomism, the atomism of the Tractatus and uh, of Russell's work in the uh, 19, 19 teens, so 1915 and so uh, around then. So yes, it was logical atomism and I think it's been pretty much exploded. <laughs> Over the past years, you've also written quite a lot about truth. And I remember you started writing about it before this whole kind of era of post-truth. Yes. I did. Sort of dawned on us. I did, yes. What, what had motivated you at the time? Was it, uh, did you feel there was about to be a shift in politics? Was it a pure philosophical mm -hmm. interest that drew you to the um, question? Uh, I think it started as a pure philosophical issue. I was interested in, um, especially some of the things that uh, the Cambridge philosopher Frank Ramsey, a young genius who died very young, um, had said about truth, and some of the things Frege said about truth in uh, his essay, The Thought. Um, so that was a purely academic interest. But as the um, last millennium drew to its close, of course, the, the um, uh, very skeptical kind of ism, postmodernism, took hold. And that uh, and, for example, the work of Richard Rorty in promoting that um, annoyed me. I think thought we, we had to do better than this. Um, so I revisited Truth then, and in 2005 I wrote one book about Truth, and then more recently uh, another smaller one. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's always been a, a real interest of mine. I mean, it's a peculiar interest because, of course, uh, I tend to think there's nothing to say about it, but that's a longer quote, longer story. <laughs> what do you see as the biggest philosophical question that still hasn't received a satisfactory enough account and one that contemporary philosophers should be focusing on? That's a very good question. Um, I think that um, there are, there's, uh, I think there's too much focus on the philosophy of mind consciousness and all that, the so-called hard problem of consciousness, um, I think that's a problem that deserves dissolution. Um, so my, my instinct is always to try to, make, to try to make philosophy easy, uh, but that does involve sort of dismantling some very hard questions. And so I, what I'd like to see is more skepticism in the philosophical profession both about alleged hard problems and about the methods that are necessary to tackle them. Uh, you mentioned earlier on analytical philosophy was, in a sense, founded on 
sand. And um, uh, yet people still behave as if it's the be-all and end-all, as if it's the only philosophy in town. And I think that ought to change. There is a, there is a nice uh, uh, eclecticism come onto the scene. People now read Nietzsche with pleasure. Some people, I think, read Hegel with pleasure, which is much more amazing to me. Um, and I think of, uh, there's a plurality of voices in the academy, which I welcome. So do you think we're entering a sort of post-analytic philosophy era, as it were, when we would leave behind the certainties of the 20th century and yes. try and find our feet again in some I, other way? I think, it, I think we, we have. I think a sensible pragmatism is now one of the principal movements in philosophy, and I'm very pleased to have been involved with it. Simon Blackburn, thank you very much. Thank you very much. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.